So let's go ahead and start our analysis. We have <clears throat> how many signals? Three signals, which means three unique hydrogens. The next analysis would be chemical shift. Right? In our chemical shift, less than two, we said was alkanes. That last signal is a little bit above two. What do you want to call it? We can call it anything. I'm fine with that. Next piece of information. Our integration. I personally start with sets of three because sets of three gives me a CH3, which means I'm at the end of the molecule. If I pick anything else, I likely have two directions to go. That's more difficult for me to process. So I tend to start at the end. So I have a carbon bound to a hydrogen. There's three of them. Right? And that's what that tells me. Or the next one. I have a carbon bound to a hydrogen. Pen. Pen. There it goes. And the next one. Two hydrogens. Last one. Whoops. I don't know that that is carbon necessarily yet, based off the analysis you guys have told me, so I'll leave that alone. All right. And I've now shown basic information. Okay. We should not try and go through and link these yet, because we have more to analyze. If you cannot analyze more, that's fine. That would be looking at the splitting patterns, and that gets much more challenging. So what could you do in that circumstance? If you can't analyze any more of the spectra, what should you do? What's the next step? We've looked at IR, we looked at mass spec, we looked at carbon NMR, and now we said we can't analyze the hydrogen NMR anymore. Start piecing it together. Okay? If you can't analyze the splitting pattern, that's fine. Accept it. Just try and jam things together and hope it works. Okay. We're, in theory, a little bit more advanced than that, so we aren't going to just try and jam things together. We're going to look at those splitting patterns. Again, with the splitting patterns, I would jump to the 3H, because, again, that's the end of my structure. I only have one direction to go. Okay. I have three peaks, which means two neighbors, which means that signal is next to a carbon with two hydrogens. Oh, look at that. I conveniently drew that next door. I wonder if somebody knew something. Okay. So look, we now have two neighbors in the blue hydrogens. Okay. I personally, again, say, well, I've now drawn this extra information in. I've added hydrogens in my analysis. If my analysis is correct, which it had better be, I should find that same signal somewhere else in my spectra. What do I know about those new hydrogens that I just showed? Officially, it's those blue hydrogens that connect to that bond. Well, I know there's two of them, and they have at least, at least three neighbors for the moment, because okay, we're adding that in. This is a new layer on top. All right, so I would go down to my data. Well, I have a three. Oh, well, it can't be the three one. I just analyzed that, and it doesn't match. So I know I have two. Okay, there's two peaks here. I have at least three neighbors, which means how many peaks? Four peaks. Well, the far left one has three peaks, so it can't be that one. That means it has to be the blue one. How many peaks does the blue one have? Six. Six. So, so far, so good. I have at least four peaks, okay? but I have two more. What does that then mean? That set of hydrogens has to have two more neighbors, which means... it has to be next to a CH2 with two hydrogens attached. Now it has five total neighbors. Well, that would give me six peaks. That's exactly what I want. But I've just added more hydrogens in my analysis, which then means I need to verify that those hydrogens are in my spectra. What do I know about those new hydrogens? There's two of them, and they have how many neighbors? Two. 
So I expect a two hydrogen signal with three peaks. Well, it can't be that two, it'd have to be this two, and oh my gosh, it has three peaks. What does that mean? The one with the red signal happens to be the ones I just found out here. The lovely thing about this method, instead of going through that table with all these different lines, oh my gosh, look at all that extra work. There it is. My HNMR tells me I have this. All right. What is the problem with this? Okay. There's a lot of problems with it. There's missing a bond. There's only three carbons. Okay. Why are those problems? And the missing bond, we should be able to nail down right away, is a problem within the HNMR. But you're saying missing a carbon. Going back to our carbon NMR, we're supposed to have four. I only have three carbons. Going back to our mass spec, we're supposed to have eight. And I only have three. Okay. So I'm missing some stuff. Okay. This is where I would take advantage of the mass spec. The mass spec said C8H14. What am I missing in this? I'm missing carbons and hydrogens. How many carbons am I missing? Five. How many hydrogens am I missing? Seven. Oh, yeah, that is seven. <laughs> How many hydrogens are in this structure? Seven. Huh. If I doubled this thing... That accounts for all my hydrogens and takes care of some carbons. But at the same time as doing that, I don't add more carbons and I don't add more hydrogens to either my carbon NMR or my hydrogen NMR because symmetry. I'm adding the exact same piece. Okay, so I have two of those. So let's draw that second piece down here. I'm not showing all the bonds again. That was silly. Okay. And now in my missing pieces, I'm only missing two carbons. Okay. Well, those two carbons need to get added to the structure in such a way they don't bring in more hydrogens and they need to be identical to each other so that we don't get new carbons in our structure. So I could add one here, and that means I would also have to add one here. Yeah? yeah. But then I'm missing three bonds. Well, minimally, those have to be connected. Okay, so really, I'm only missing four bonds. But they can't be hydrogen, can't be chlorine, can't be bromine, can't be nitrogen. If we calculated our degrees of unsaturation, what was our degrees of unsaturation? Two. Two, which means two pi bonds. What happens if I get rid of two of those bonds by making them a pi bond? Now what do I have? A triple bond. Okay. That satisfies our carbon NMR. That satisfies our hydrogen NMR. That satisfies our mass spec. Does it satisfy our IR? Hmm. You're saying no. Why? The IR only said CHSP3s. Is there another type of bond in here? Yeah. What is that other type of bond? Uh, I don't accept SP. SP is not a bond. A CC triple bond. Where should the CC triple bond show up? 22. So we should, we should be reviewing those numbers. About 2200. Okay. And if we went back all the way to our... Can I go back to the IR? Which means all this work is deleted. If we go back to the IR... What is in that 2200 range? A fat load of nothing. There's nothing there. What is going on? Because that triple bond should be characteristic, huge, and showing up. 
Sorry, for those of you looking at home, you might want to close your eyes or people even here. IR is all about dipoles, difference in electronegativity. Right? What is the issue with the triple bond that we just addressed? It is perfectly symmetric off either end of it, which then means it becomes IR inactive or invisible, and we cannot see it. It does not show up in the IR. The triple bond is one of the kind of characteristic IR inactive bonds if it is symmetrical. Right, so you almost always see it as a trick question, and unless you're actually paying attention, it just kind of falls through the cracks and you can't figure it out. Okay? I've fallen in that trap many a time. Okay? So we just kind of have to be aware of that. That is one of our characteristics. Okay? We're looking at a dipole. Conversely, what if there was a huge dipole? What happens to the signal? No dipole means no signal. What's going to happen if we have a dipole? It's going to be a really big signal. Say, like the difference in electronegativity between carbon and oxygen. Such a large difference and such a large dipole that what do we get? A massively intense signal. Okay? So there are ways that signals can be hidden in pretty much all of our spectra. Some of them you're more responsible for than others. IR is the big one. Okay, questions about that? So how would you name that compound now that I've got it erased? And this would be another moment to close your eyes again if you get dizzy. Okay, you can open your eyes again. What was the name of our compound? <laughs> Listing out the atoms does not count as naming the compound. <laughs> we had two CH3 or CH2, CH2, CH3s on either end, and then we had the carbon triple bond in between. How many carbons do we have? We have eight carbons, so we have oct four, because at position four we have a triple bond, ion. And we have oct four ion. Okay. Something that I learned in attempting to download the uh, nomenclature rules, that is the official way to name it. The unofficial way that you will sometimes see, though is apparently technically incorrect, is calling it 4-octine, just so you know. It's one of those things I was like, huh, really? That's fun. So everybody, almost everybody will call it the 4-octine because it's easier to say, but it's technically wrong. What is that saying? What's that? That four, uh, so that's what it comes down to. What is that four applying to? It's not applying to the opt. It's applying to the ion. So the four is kind of placed in an incorrect spot. But we can't say, you wouldn't say four opt. That doesn't make sense. So the four is kind of, uh, through process of elimination, only applying to the ion. So we can assume that that's where it's tied and that's why it's, why it's okay. Questions about that? Okay. So, NMR, take our sample that is magnetic, drop it in a magnet, and then we piss it off with radio waves. Right? The radio waves then get timed to figure out or draw information out about the hydrogens, right? or about whatever atom is magnetic. Hydrogen and carbon just happen to be the most common isotopes because we have uh, the highest concentration of those in their magnetic state. There are other elements that are also magnetic. You're not responsible for those, so don't stress about them. But you might see those in future classes. Okay? Your electrons will act as shields. Okay? They're little, well, effectively, electrons are spinning magnets. Okay? That can act as a shield and hide that hydrogen 
from the external magnet, which then means its relaxation time to get back to the standard magnetic field is tweaked. Okay. That's why we can then tie that hydrogen's chemical environment back to a signal. By looking at the signal, say, oh, that means it's connected to this atom, or it's near this functional group. And that's where that is coming from. Your spectrometer, giant magnet, sample, put it in there, little controller magnet, detector, all this kind of fun stuff. Okay. Fun and dandy. You might say, well, that doesn't look that big. This is a big one, 850 megahertz. Uh, and yes, you need stairs to get up to where you put the sample in. Okay. Um, so really, really big. Also a fun thing about these is they are massively magnetic. See that little red line? Uh, I think that's a red line. Okay. There's a red circle going all the way around there. And I think that orange line is another one. That red circle means if you are magnetic at any point past this line, you're going to get stuck. Uh, that orange line is probably the, if you have anything that is magnetic, it is going to start to pull. Uh, anything like credit cards are now demagnetized and useless. Okay. Um, so you have to, like, you, whenever you go in, you'll see people take out their keys and all this other stuff um, because it's not particularly fun. Okay. Um, I think I've seen YouTube videos of, because MRI is the same thing. An MRI is one of these, just turned on its side, and they're detecting a different thing. I think I've seen YouTube videos of people not paying attention with the MRI and carrying around like gas cylinders, like, oh, hum to hum to hum, and all of a sudden, whoosh, okay? Um, which usually pisses people off because your gas cylinder now just destroyed the MRI. Um, and if as long as you were lucky, you didn't break the top of the gas cylinder off, because then you have a secondary bomb of the gas cylinder launching. Okay. Um, so yeah, if you were curious about that and how strong these things are, they are really, really, really strong. Okay. Um, interesting fact. Um, yeah, I just won't record it. OK, now that we've done that, <clears throat> experimental conditions. So more or less deshielded than what? So it's all coming back to seeing the signal that appears. But where does that signal appear? And I say, well, the chemical shift. It shows up between 0 and 14. Well, how did you know it was 0? How did you know it was 14? You need a standard. You have to have something to compare to. That comparison is typically TMS, okay? tetramethylsilane. That signal is dumped into almost every sample, and it is defined as 0. So sometimes if you're looking at a real spectra, you'll see a little peak at zero. What does that peak mean? They used a standard. Okay. If you don't see it, that doesn't mean it's not present. That just means somebody either removed it from the signal or it was a digitally generated signal so you don't see that zero point. Okay. Um, organic protons will then show up shifted, uh, less shielded than that position, okay? Also known as downfield. You sometimes hear the downfield aspect. <clears throat> the next issue, the sample must tumble or move. Why? Simplest example, if we took cyclohexane. On cyclohexane, do we have different hydrogens? Cyclohexane. And this might be a, a good hint here. Does cyclohexane give us different hydrogens? Yes. <clears throat> we have axial and equatorial. If our sample doesn't move, then those hydrogens are different from each other, which then means what happens to our spectra. We see a lot more peaks show up because of that. Okay. Well, what if we had a more complex structure? Well, if it doesn't move, if one hydrogen happens to be looking out the window and one hydrogen happens to be looking at the floor, those hydrogens are now chemically different. And we don't see the nice, clean spectra. We just see this massive noise pollution of peaks everywhere because every single hydrogen is different. The only way we can actually detect those hydrogens and keep them, kind of group them, is because we allow our molecules to constantly move, which means the hydrogen that's looking out the window and the hydrogen looking at the floor as long as their chemical environments 
are the same in the standard molecule, they will both freely spin and rotate so that they are both looking at the floor or out the window and they can become chemically uh, identical. Okay, so our molecules must be allowed to freely spin. Okay. Well, what's the problem? Of the organic compounds you've worked with this semester, are all of them liquids? No. So to run an NMR, we will typically have to dissolve our solvent or dissolve our compounds in a solvent. Typically, we use chloroform or dimethyl sulfoxide. What is an issue with adding an organic solvent? For those of you that aren't perfect with your nomenclature, chloroform, dimethyl sulfoxide. Anybody see an issue with these solvents? You're adding hydrogen and you're adding carbon, carbon which means you're going to see those signals show up in your sa sample. Okay? Since we're adding it as a solvent, what is the relative concentration? Exceptionally high. That means the signal for, say, chloroform is now insanely huge, probably so huge that it will actually wipe out all of our data. So how do we prevent that from happening? Don't add hydrogen. What is D? Deuterium. Deuterium. Okay. The deuterium does not have a hydro or have a magnetic signal associated with it, so that takes our chloroform some signal and effectively disappears it. Okay. We will get proton exchange, so you'll almost always in a real spectra see a signal for your solvent. For chloroform, it shows up at 7.26 as a single peak uh, in hydrogen NMR, and 77.2 as a triplet signal in carbon NMR. So for those of you looking at the ABC, I think they were ABC, in the spectroscopy packet, those were real spectra. Those have chloroform in them. So you will see those signals pop up. DMSO is almost always labeled as D6 DMSO because... We need six deuterium. Dimethyl. A methyl has three hydrogens, two methyls. I need six deuteriums. Right? Those solvents end up being expensive, and you can actually isolate deuterium and make money if you really wanted to. Okay? Things to get, number of signals, chemical shift, integration, and multiplicity. Okay? This does come from levels of difficulty. Start with your number of signals. This will give you your number of unique hydrogens and carbons. Your chemical shift gives you the rough local environment for your hydrogen or carbon. Integration gives you a ratio, and I cannot stress this enough, a ratio of unique hydrogens in your compound, not the exact number. Right? It depends on the compound, and it depends on the person giving you the question. And then the last one, splitting, right? it's the number of different hydrogen neighbors. As far as difficulty, the number of signals is relatively easy. Getting into the splitting, that can be very, very, very difficult. Okay? That said, you talk to people that have experience, where do they immediately jump to? The splitting, because they have that experience. Okay? Hopefully at this point you have that experience and you can start skipping and jumping to that analysis point. Okay? If you aren't confident, don't look at it evaluate the other pieces and get what you can out of it. Make sense? Number of signals. Let's take a look at this structure. How many hydrogen signals would we expect for this compound? Are there hydrogens here? Yeah, so there's one. Are there hydrogens here? Are they different than the red hydrogens? Yes. I mean, CH3 and CH3, aren't those the same? But what they're connected to is different, right? So we can't tell the difference between them. Uh, how about that hydrogen? Okay. Should show up. Also different. So there's three hydrogens. Somebody was saying four. We also have the implied hydrogen there, right? So four signals, right? Unfortunately, we're wrong. Where's the last signal? Oh, 
Well, there's more hydrogens, right? Aren't those all the same? All the red hydrogens? Yes. Yeah. How about the purple hydrogens? Yes. Yeah? I know, color coding might be difficult to see up on our projectors. That's CH2. One of those is blue, one of those is orange. Are those the same? Okay, well, I'm coloring them differently, so we might know. No, they're not the same. Okay, why are they not the same? Because of this SOB here being chiral. Because that is chiral, if we now go through and add in wedges and dashes, that blue, if we assume it's wedge, and that hydrogen, if we, or the orange, if we assume that's dashed. The relationship between the wedged chlorine and the blue wedged hydrogen is different than the relationship between the wedged chlorine and the dashed hydrogen. We can never get the blue and hydrogen, blue and orange hydrogens into the same local environment with respect to the chlorine. It is physically impossible. What does that then mean? They are different. The blue hydrogen and the orange hydrogen are chemically distinct, and we end up seeing five different signals. Okay. Sort of. What's that sort of? We have the potential to see five different signals. What does that potential mean? If our magnet is strong enough, it will allow us to differentiate and see the difference between the blue and the orange. If our magnet isn't, isn't strong enough, what happens to the signal between the blue and the orange? they get overlapped to the point where we can't distinguish them and they end up giving us the same signal. So a lot of the chemically unique things comes back to the magnet. So what you're responsible for is looking at a structure and saying, these are all unique. You're not responsible for saying, well, if I look at the spectra, I'll see those five unique signals. Okay. And the big case where this becomes a problem is chiral atoms. If there's a chiral atom in your structure, everything turns hellish really, really fast. Okay? For those of you that are really curious, and well, I really don't think it's all that hellish, take a look at unknown 4 in the spectroscopy packet. Unknown 4 has a chiral atom in it okay, that is resolved. Okay? And you'll notice in the splitting patterns on that, it says complex multiplet. And I had a bunch of people, well, I can count five peaks. No, you can't count five peaks. What you're counting is a potential overlap, maybe, of five peaks. Okay? The splitting pattern there is a complex multiplet. Okay? It is officially a doublet of doublet of quartets. Well, what the hell is that? We'll get to that. Okay? So if you see a chiral atom, be careful when you evaluate your differences. This comes back to labeling things by these extra subclassifications, homotopic, enantiotopic, and diastereotopic. Okay? These three words confuse the hell out of me. Um, I did review it to try and make sure I could teach it, and then I forgot about it, so I'm not even sure I can do it right, but we'll attempt. If we take that blue hydrogen and replace it with something else, okay, how many hydrogens will we get in our sample? If we do the same thing with the orange one, how many hydrogens do we get? Okay? So it comes down to evaluating the difference between those hydrogens and how that translates to the number of signals that we get. If they're enantiotopic, we get the exact same signal out of it. If they're homotopic, we get the exact same signal out of it, except there was no chiral atom involved. If they're diastereotopic, then those hydrogens are unique. That one I can explain. Erase one of those hydrogens and make it bromine. If we go through and do the same thing with the other one, What is the relationship between these two structures? Diastereomers, which means the hydrogens that are replaced are diastereotopic. Okay? I will never test you on that if I can't keep it straight for four hours. I don't expect you to even come close. Okay. Any debates on that? You guys want to challenge that? I'm not even sure I could write a question, believe it or not, actually. I'm really going to get into it. Chemical shift. What is the difference between ethyl acetate and methyl propanoate? Officially, you should be able to draw out these structures. Does anybody want to give it a shot on your own first?
it sounded like a no. Ethyl, two carbons. Acetate. We have, I drew that ugly, but that's ethyl acetate. I can color code that a little better. That's acetate, and that's our ethyl. Methyl propanoate. Methyl, one carbon, our propanoate. One, two, three carbons. Right, so those are our structures. How are they different from each other? What would you expect to see in your NMR? How about carbon NMR? How many signals? Four and? Four. Okay. So that's not a big deal. Let's take a look at hydrogen NMR. How many signals? Same, I don't accept. Or what do you mean by same? Four, I don't accept. It's three and three. There's not four hydrogens there. There's a hydrogen. Whoops. There's a hydrogen out here. There's hydrogen here. And there's hydrogen here. This atom's not chiral. It's, in fact, achiral. So we don't have to worry about it. So we get three different hydrogens. So that doesn't help. Uh, what about splitting patterns? Or, sorry, let's not do splitting patterns. Uh, we're going to skip chemical shift for the moment. Integration. Three, two, three, right? The other one would be three, two, three. Well, that, that was an obvious difference, so that didn't work out. How about neighbors? On our far right, how many neighbors do we have? We have two neighbors. The next one, three. Last one, zero. Next one over, zero, three, two. Hmm. So the number of signals didn't work. The integration didn't work. Splitting didn't work. Well, I guess that's all my choices. I can't tell the difference. Chemical shift. The only way we can tell the difference here is looking at the chemical shift. And this is where people kind of freak out a little bit. Right? Because, well, you didn't tell me to memorize it. That's right. I did not tell you to memorize this, but we do have the context to understand how and why things would change. Right? What happens if I put an oxygen near a hydrogen? What does the oxygen do to the electrons? It takes them away. It de-shields our hydrogen. If it's now de-shielded, what happens to it? It shifts more towards the left because we've got that weird reverse spectrum or downfield. Okay. So if I take a look at the ethyl acetate, which signal would I expect to be shifted most downfield? The hydrogens on the CH2, I'll accept that. These hydrogens are closest to the oxygen, which would mean the signal for our CH2 should show up furthest downfield from the other ones. What about the carbon directly bonded to the oxygen? Which oxygen? Which carbon? Because that one is bonded. What about this one? Where would that one show up? Probably the exact same location the other one does. Okay. So our carbon NMR isn't going to help us. What we have to do is look at the hydrogen NMR. And since there is no hydrogens at that position, that doesn't help us. Okay. Which signal shows up most downfield for a methylpropanoate? This CH3, most downfield. So all I've got to do to tell the difference here is take a look and see which signal shows up furthest downfield. If it is a singlet, as in it has one peak, no neighbors, then I know the structure I'm looking at is methylpropanoid. If the one that I see shifted most downfield is a quartet, 
Then I know three neighbors, three neighbors which corresponds to the ethyl acetate. Right. So our chemical shift ranges, or the ranges I told you to memorize, are the bulk ones, because it's easy to memorize those. Right. Open up the textbook, I forget what page it is. They will list out, I think, 20 different uh, potential ranges. Right. You mind if I flip while I talk? Yeah. Uh, they'll list out a whole bunch of different ones, right, which is probably something you don't want to memorize. So don't. Mm, there it is. Page 770 in our textbook, chapter 16. Lists... 20. Exactly 20? Oh, well, look at that. 20 different signals. Okay. That's a lot of things to memorize. Okay. Particularly because if you go through and look at it, there's probably about 10 of them that all show up in the exact same range. Okay. If they're showing up in the same range, how do you know which one's which? You don't. It's like analyzing the fingerprint region. Okay. Skip it, move on, and get some other information. Make sense? Okay. Integration only gives you the ratios. Multiple ways we can see the integration. You can see a number written under. You can see probably be a 2H written next to. You may also see, if you find some really old school chemist, something that looks like this, which is showing the integration curve. Okay. It's just showing the area underneath the curve. The old school way was literally to get a pair of scissors, cut this part out, cut this part out, cut this part out, and then weigh them. You can then compare the weights of the paper to get you your ratio. <laughs> yeah, how awesome is that? Okay. So all it does is give you the ratio of hydrogens. The number is almost always given to you except for your final. And when it comes to the final, you're expected to roughly compare the heights, which would suggest that these three all have the same number of hydrogens, and this one has more. That would be my first pass. The second pass, if I had to, I would probably say three, two, two, two. Okay. And then I probably also admit that I am wrong here because what shows up at 10? The aldehyde hydrogen, which means more than likely that's not a 2H. That has to be more than likely a 1H. I don't know why I'm writing H. A 1. Okay. It's showing up as a 1, and I would probably still settle these as 2s because they have more peaks. Is it perfect? Not by a long shot, but it gets you close enough. Complex splitting. Okay, this goes to our splitting of splitting. This comes out of four. We're going to take a look at kind of the important one. I want to know the neighbors of this dashed hydrogen. What would I expect its splitting pattern to be? What causes splitting? Or, sorry, what causes our multiplicity? Neighbors. Number of neighbors. So we need to find our neighbors. Okay, so it's three bonds. One, two, three bonds away, I'm out of hydrogen. One, two, three bonds away, I'm out of another hydrogen, so I have two neighbors. One, two, three bonds away, I'm out of another hydrogen, I have three neighbors to the left. How about to the right? Well, one bond, two bonds. Three bonds, I'm out of hydrogen. One bond, two bonds, three bonds, I'm out of hydrogen. And we'd say we have how many neighbors? Five neighbors. Five neighbors gives us six peaks. And in this case, we would be wrong. And why are we wrong? Well, for a couple reasons. Are the black hydrogen and the purple hydrogen the same? No, they are different, so I can't group them all together as one neighbor. So what happens? Well, for our red signal, it sees the two purple hydrogens and it splits. What would the two purple hydrogens <laughs> cause our signal to split into? Three peaks. So we have a triplet. And for those of you going, wow, this seems really difficult already, then just take a minute, close your eyes, close your ears, do whatever you got to do. But now it sees the black neighbors. How many neighbors are over there? 
three, which means the signal needs to split into four peaks. But the signal has already split, which means what do I have to do? Split the already split signal, which means I get one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. What is this referred to? This is a triplet of quartets. This is referring to complex splitting patterns. Okay? Officially, if you have different hydrogens, it splits your signal uniquely from everything else. You cannot group them all together as one big term. More than likely, what happens with our spectrum? The distance between each of those peaks gets so small that they start to overlap. They start to overlap in such a way that what we end up seeing is six peaks. And we go, oh, it has five neighbors. And we just draw our conclusion. Okay? That's the nice, pretty way to look at multiplicity. Just the number of neighbors, number of peaks, everything works out. That is what I expect of you for the majority of the exam. At least one question will hit you on this splitting of splitting. It has to do with different neighbors. Yes? Um, okay, so I have a clarification. Why did we establish the two purple hydrogens as being similar for these three of the same three? We did not actually establish them as being similar. So what someone else went through and did is said, there's five neighbors. It gives me six peaks. They actually did not distinguish between those being different or not. Are they different? Yes. Which means we can't group them together to say six peaks. We have to look at it as a triplet of quartets. Is that the only option out of this? What if our lucky red hydrogen saw the black neighbors first? It would split into four peaks. That then splits into three peaks. So we could end up with a quartet of triplets or a triplet of quartets, depending on which hydrogens grouped to each other more strongly. The spectra will tell you. I don't expect you to predict that. Okay? The next big kind of caveat we can throw in this long distance splitting. Our rule was three bonds. Okay? Almost everybody says, oh, it has to be three bonds. No. It's less than three bonds. The standard is three bonds away, but it's less than three bonds count. Okay. The next part is that that's really three sigma bonds. What happens if we throw in a pi bond? What happens to the distance? It gets shorter. Well, if it gets shorter, what does that mean? We can potentially go further to see a neighbor. So you will sometimes see what is known as long distance splitting it almost always involves at least one pi bond. Okay? So you'll do three sigma and a pi. Okay? That typically happens with aromatic rings. If you want to see examples of that, I believe that's unknown five. No, it's got to be one of the letters. It's got to be B or C in the, the sample packet, if you wanted to see that. Again, not standard, requires a strong magnet. Last thing we'll mention, because it shows up in the homework, coupling constant. Okay. We take a look at hydrogen C and D. They will be coupled to each other because they are neighbors. Okay. You have a relationship with your neighbor that nobody else does. Okay. We can define that relationship. Okay. My relationship with my neighbor is different than your relationship with your neighbor. So we can look at and define those relationships and say, oh, well, that's because it's Mike and Patrick and not Jan and Liz. Elizabeth. Okay? That coupling constant can get totaled, put into a table, and can be analyzed just like your chemical shifts. Okay? I, again, don't expect you to memorize it. I expect you to be aware of it and look it up in a homework question. And yes, it does show up in a homework question. And yes, it shows up in such a way that it freaks the tutors out. Right? Because it is an exceptionally difficult question. Right? So process through the question slowly. You should be able to get to the point where you can 
solve for an approximate structure, you'll end up with three possible options. You can either guess your way through those three possible options, or you look up coupling constants in your textbook, and it'll tell you what the relationship is. Okay? It's just telling you the distance between the peaks and your splitting. Oh, look, you can also look there. Okay. For reference, just so you guys know, this structure, this structure, and this structure. What is the difference between those three stars? The locations of the hydrogens relative to each other. Because the distance has changed, what does that mean happens to how well they see each other as neighbors? That also changes. So we can look at the distance between them as neighbors and define that according to our coupling constants. Okay? One of those weird kind of extra loopy things, interesting. If you want to talk to me after class, we can go through it, but I don't think it's really worth spending any more time on. And our last big little bit of hopscotch back into nomenclature. We had our chiral atoms. We could identify them as different by going to spectroscopy and seeing, does that spectra look like a god-awful mess? Yes, cool, there's a chiral atom. Okay. Let's try and differentiate this a little bit better. We want to be able to look at a compound and quickly classify it. We could look at optical activity and say, okay, is it optically active or inactive? But what if we're just given the structure? Okay. What this is going to come back to is something known as the kahn ingold prelog rules. I would say up to about five years ago, I heard people reference the kahn ingold prelog rules, and I was like, what are they talking about? They must have been in a different organic chemistry class than me. It's like the rule set for defining R, S, and cis and trans. Okay? And it just so happens that I never learned the name of it was kahn ingold prelog. Okay? Um, but that is officially what it is. Okay? So here's our priority system for assigning R and S. Okay? And this kind of works for cis and trans too. Identify your chiral carbon. So you can't just, or you don't want to just do this for every single carbon. Okay? Find your chiral carbon first, and then go through and follow the rules. To be chiral, what do we need to see? An atom with four different things attached. Very typically, it'll just be carbon, but we have others. Right? We then go through and assign priority to each of those substituents by their atomic mass. Okay? You will find also that if you ask me about this, sometimes I forget atomic mass. Okay? So you can remind me now, because you all remember. It goes based off atomic mass. Okay? The higher the atomic mass, the higher the priority. What if there's no difference between the atoms? You go out one further atom, okay? and then you ask yourself the same question. Is there a difference in atomic mass? What if there's no difference? You go out again and again and again until you find a difference. If you don't find a difference, you screwed up. You shouldn't have even been looking at it because it wasn't a chiral atom. Okay? You will eventually find that difference. Notice that this is atomic mass. We're going atom by atom, not the size of the group or how many things are out there. It's the atom. Okay? There's one extra rule. What happens if you encounter multiple bonds? Well, chirality is going off of sp3 atoms, which means if I have a multiple bond, do I have an sp3 atom? No. So if we encounter a multiple bond, we have a new rule. A pi bond must be treated as a phantom sigma bond. So if I have a carbon-carbon double bond, that carbon is bonded to a carbon, and it also has a phantom bond to another carbon. Okay. Yes, that's tricky. Hopefully we'll see an example here. I know, it's weird. I don't like it either. Okay. Once we've established our priorities, we then need to reorient the molecule so that the lowest priority is aimed away from you. So it must be dashed. Once it is dashed, you can then connect a, an arrow from your highest priority to the second to the third. What has to be? What's that? What has to be no wedges. Lowest priority needs to be dashed. Okay, needs to be away from you. You then connect one, two, three, and you look at how they connect. Do they connect in a fashion? 
as shown up here. Which direction are we going? Clockwise. Clockwise. We call that R. What if when we connected it, it went counterclockwise? It would be S. The one pseudo kind of hint or exception that I'll give you with this is we have one shortcut for the orient the molecule so lowest priority is aimed away from you. There's two orientations that are nice. When lowest priority is aimed away, you just do these rules. You're good. What if it's aimed at you? All you have to do is reverse it. Which way is my hand moving? If we just change our viewpoint on the molecule, it appears to switch. Okay? So if it's coming at you, do the same things all here, but just switch it. Okay? If it's going away from you, you just do the same rules, and we don't have to worry about it. That is the only shortcut I have ever successfully used. Okay? I've seen plenty of other shortcuts that people just try, oh, you just do this, this, this. Oh. I lost you at this. Probably more at this. I've also heard the right-hand rule come in, and maybe I just did not do well enough at physics. Okay. Um, whatever way you want to make sure that you assign it correctly and consistently correct is fine by me. Here's the next big issue with this. I think most students go through, oh, I totally understand how to do this, and they get the answer right okay, in their first question. In the first question, what is the effective level of difficulty? It's a true or false question. You could guess and get the answer right. Just because you get one question right does not a good method make. Okay? You need to be able to consistently get this right. And that's why I gave up on all these other goofy methods, because I could never consistently use them. Okay? So please be aware of that if you're using anything other than this kind of long rule set. So let's take a look at a couple examples. Let's take a look at the upper left. I have two chiral atoms. I'm going to label them by different colors. We'll use red and purple. So for the red chiral atom, I've got my four different things. I've got my chlorine, which is number one. I've got my hydrogen, which is number four. Typically, you should be able to identify one and four very, very quickly. Okay. Two and three usually become, excuse me, a little bit more of a challenge. We go out to a carbon versus a carbon. Is there a difference? No. So what do we do? We go out one more. Okay. Well, which do I go out to? So I've got hydrogens here and I've got a carbon here. What should I go out to? Go to the highest priority atom. Which is higher priority, carbon or hydrogen? Carbon. So I'm going to compare this carbon to chlorine. Which is higher priority? Chlorine. Which then means this carbon is higher priority than that carbon, which then means 2, 3. We clean that all up. Hydrogen is already aimed away from us. 1, to two to three, and what do we have? As clockwise, R. <laughs> Purple. One, two, three, four. One to two, two to three. I'm going counterclockwise, so I'd say S, but I'm looking at it backwards. The lowest priority is aimed at me currently, which means I need to invert that into an R. And the structure is RR. When it's coming at you, you flip it. When it's going away, it's perfectly correct. You just assign it as is. The lowest priority must be aimed away. Red one, lowest priority is aimed away. We just assigned it. The purple one, where was the lowest priority? Facing, Facing at you. When we did our assignment, we said S. That's wrong, because we're looking at it backwards. We have to make it R. Okay. 
right? So it's just a question of following the rule set and establishing your differences. Kind of, sort of? Let's move to the bottom example. What priority can you assign right away? Hydrogen is four. We're then going out and comparing carbon to carbon to carbon. What should we do? We officially can't make the comparison yet. So carbons to carbons, fine. Can't tell the difference, so we want to move one carbon further away. Before we do that one carbon further away, we must evaluate something else. Are all of those atoms sp3 hybridized? No. So I have to take into consideration that pi bond, and this is where that stupid rule comes into play. I have a phantom bond on that carbon going out to a carbon. That other carbon of the pi bond also has a phantom bond going out to a carbon. Because that's perfectly understandable. <laughs> if we evaluate our differences, <clears throat> we notice the CH3 goes out to three hydrogens. Our other carbons go out to carbons. So the CH3 should be the lowest of that set. How do we decide between the next two? Well, this goes out to hydrogen, carbon, and carbon. The other one goes out to carbon, hydrogen, and hydrogen. Where's the priority difference? Carbon versus hydrogen. And we would say the top one takes highest priority. Bottom one is the next. We connect one to two to three. Which direction are we moving? Yes, that is counterclockwise, which is S. And that is my stereo center. Okay. Ballpark. I do not guarantee it, but if you have hybridization or less hybridization, that atom tends to carry a higher priority than other atoms. Not always true, but it's pretty close. Okay? Lower hybridization, higher priority. The carbon up top was sp2, the carbon on the bottom was sp3. Okay? And just because we need to talk about it, we'll take a, probably make an extra credit on the exam. Uh, Fisher projections. If we took the molecule shown, we have four stereo centers, which means going through and assigning R and S for every single one of those. And that sucks, right? We don't want to do that. Okay? Biochemists agree. So biochemists said, let's invent a new system. Because we didn't have enough systems to worry about, let's invent a new one. Okay? But in this new one, I'm going to get rid of this wedge dash stuff so I don't have to think about it. So rule number one was orient the carbon chain on the vertical axis. Well, the carbon chain is on the vertical axis. Okay? As a secondary part of that, the highest priority carbon needs to be up at the top. Okay? So the carbon with the sp2 carbonyl is higher priority than the alcohol down below. So our highest priority carbon is at the top of this drawing. The vertical axis must also be aimed away from you. Okay, so if I take my structure, because notice it's zigzagged, it's not on the vertical axis. I'm just going to take it, and I'm grabbing the OHs on the left, and I'm going to pull them out of the plane of the board, put them on the right-hand side. Now what happens? The vertical axis, carbons are all on that vertical axis. But notice the issue with it. If we take a look at that top carbon, so we'd be viewing, I don't know why i got a point, I've got drawings. Oof. It's an ugly eyeball. <laughs> We're looking right there. Where's that carbon backbone? It's going away. So that carbon is perfectly aligned. What happens if we move the eye to down here and looking at that carbon? Where's the backbone? It's coming towards the eyeball. Well, that's oriented wrong. We've got to spin it. Okay? And that's what this drawing is trying to show. As we move down, each of those is going to be slightly adjusted. Our carbon backbone is not perfectly aimed away. So what do we have to do? We'll have to rotate sigma bonds to make it away. But if I rotate that second carbon, where does the OH then go? 
being on the right-hand side, it now becomes the left-hand side. The next one down we'll find is actually perfectly organized. We don't have to do any rotations. The last one we'll have to rotate, and we'll see it spin in on the right-hand side. And we'd end up with this drawing. Because I've now organized my molecule in this fashion, I can shortcut this whole process, and I can just draw it as this. This drawing, I think I've heard fishbone before, is the Fisher projection. All the wedges and dashes have become implied. So when you talk to a biochemist, they're like, there's no organic chemistry in biochem. You can ask them about Fisher projections. And they're like, yeah, there's no organic chemistry in there. Yeah. Yeah, there's all those wedges and dashes that you think don't exist are actually present. Okay? Somebody more intelligent than you, Mr. Biochemist, or Miss Biochemist, did all the work for you. <laughs> I'm a biochemist. I'm allowed to do that. I think any biochemist would yell at deck me for that, but whatever. Okay. That is now our Fisher projection. If you go through and assign R and S, what you'll end up finding is that you are always, by definition, looking at this structure in reverse. Your hydrogens are always aimed at you. What is the stereocenter for this last OH? You will find that that one is S. The next one you will find is S. The next one you will find is R. The next one up you will find is S. S happened to be rotating counterclockwise, which means we're rotating which direction? To the left. R is rotating clockwise, which is to the right. Our highest priority functional group is on the left-hand side, so I call it R. On the right-hand side, call it S. Fisher's got that set up. You can just quickly look at it and say, oh, that's where it is. Switch it and done. Kind of nice in that respect. Okay. Why does it not get looked at? This is what happens to the molecule if you look at the Fisher projection appropriately. It spirals back on itself, which is explained in biochemistry through hemiacetals, and that's why we simplify. This is known as the Aldose family tree. This is all the possible carbohydrate combinations. Sweetness. You need to only memorize half of those. I'm just kidding. Don't worry about it. Fisher projection does show up, I think, on one or two questions. We won't make that a large part of the